the developments in the hardware of TMS and what that might do to allow us to potentially improve the reliability um, and utility of TMS in each of those domains. So very quickly, what I want to run through is just a quick overview of what we think TMS is and how we think it works before getting on to some of these more recent developments. So TMS is obviously uh, one of the methods for transcranial stimulation of uh, the brain, which means that we can bypass the barrier of the scalp and scalp, uh, the, the scalp and scalp. <laughs> um, and this gives us access to the brain without having to actually go in there um, and get our hands dirty. Now, people have been trying to transcranially stimulate the brain for many years without much success. So I think in the 1950s, Guatia, Rotti and Peterson um, actually demonstrated with two electrodes placed on the scalp that they could use transcranial electrical stimulation, um, a form of alternating current or thoracic stimulation to activate the motor areas of the brain. But it was very painful. The effect took several seconds to build up over time. Um, and so this wasn't really used uh, very much except by really enthusiastic kind of people, uh, researchers. And then in the 1980s, uh, Merton and Morton had been also trying to develop a stimulator for many years. Um, and in the 80s came up with a technique that seemed to work. So using two carefully positioned electrodes placed on the scalp and a very high voltage uh, shock that was able to overcome the high resistance of the skull on the scalp they showed that you could get a twitch on the contractual side of the body. So they were able to activate the motor cortex. And here's them doing one of the first public demonstrations of the technique. Um, they also showed that you could uh, produce phosphines if you stimulated the visual cortex, so you get uh, bright flashes of light in the visual field. Um, and so this was the kind of beginning, I guess, of um, the modern concept of transcranial electrical stimulation or transcranial stimulation in itself. But one of the problems was that it was really painful. Um, the high voltages used actually tend to recruit very strong scalp muscle contractions and they also uh, activate pain receptors in the skin. And so, um, again, this technique wasn't really and still isn't really uh, used that much except by really enthusiastic people. Um, but fortunately, it wasn't long until Tony Barker, uh, Reza Jalanus, and, and Freeston came up with um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this uses the principle of electromagnetic induction um, discovered, described by Michael Faraday. And essentially, it describes the fact that a rapidly changing magnetic field will induce an electric current in nearby conductive structures. Um, and here's Tony Barker demonstrating the technique um, back in the 80s and the magnetic field is obviously delivered via uh, this circular coil in this case and here he's holding it over the primary motor cortex on the right hemisphere and they showed with the help of uh, Merton and Morton that they were able to produce twitches in contralateral muscles so here in a hand muscle and this is a motor evoked potential on the right hand side. And this is our kind of motor neurophysiology, the classic measure of um, corticospinal excitability at the time a stimulus is delivered. And one of the nice things about this is obviously that it's relatively painless compared to electrical stimulation. And I remember talking to Brian Day and, and Janet Taylor, who used electrical stimulation quite a lot back in the day. And, and Janet Taylor is still uh, one of the few people that, that enjoys using the technique. And Brian actually said, uh, yeah, it wasn't all bad, the electrical stimulation, because uh, at the end of it, you used to feel quite elated. And Janet Taylor's response to this was, well, yeah, if you stop banging your head against a brick wall, you will feel quite good about it. Um, so they were all quite pleased when uh, TMS first came about. So quickly, I kind of want to run over uh, some of the fundamentals of TMS, what it is and what we think it, it stimulates in the brain. So first of all, TMS is, is phasic, the stimulus is very phasic. Um, 
a high current pulse is generated in the coil windings that rises very quickly um, and comes back to zero quite quickly. And this produces uh, a high Tes uh, high Tesla magnetic field, so it rises to one Tesla or more um, very quickly and comes back down within about a millisecond. And this induces a short-lived current in the nearby conductive structures, that is the brain. The induced currents that it produces are highly directional. So the current induced in the brain flows parallel to the surface of the brain and opposite in direction to the current flow in the coil itself. And this directionality um, is an important feature as we'll come to uh, a little bit later. Now TMS as a technique is focal-ish, I've said. Um, so the original designs used the circular coils and the important thing about the stimulation is that it occurs under the whole annulus of the ring. So uh, under the windings of the coil, but not in the center where the windings are. Uh, don't appear. So the original circular coils weren't very focal. Now the focality was improved by the advent of these figure of eight coils that you see here because the current uh, actually sums at the point where the two windings meet. And so you can kind of focus the stimulation to this central winding point of the coils. I'm just going to change, let me put this on. Um, Having said that, uh, modeling of the electric field during transcranial magnetic stimulation still suggests that we're probably stimulating a, a rather large patch of cortex, maybe two to four centimeters squared, which isn't very focal by the standards of, say, invasive electrical stimulation, where you can be precise to within, I don't know, maybe a half centimeter or so. The other thing to note is that TMS is typically quite superficial. And this is because um, the magnetic field drops off rapidly with distance from the coil. So for example, um, when you're about five centimeters away from the coil, the magnetic field is only at about 30% of its maximum when you're actually close to the coil, which means that we're probably stimulating uh, relatively superficial structures in the brain. So uh, gray matter and um, the very superficial white matter. So what gets activated by TMS and where? Well, it's likely that um, we're probably stimulating the axons of neurons in the cortex, and um, probably in the following order, large diameter axons, followed by small diameter axons, and potentially um, cell bodies in the initial segment region. Um, and this is because of differences in the electrical capacity of these um, different parts of the neuron which affects their threshold for stimulation. And so for example, in the primary motor cortex, um, you might expect that the large diameter pyramidal cells in layer five would have a lower threshold for stimulation than say layer two, three uh, pyramidal cells. And this is what a recent modeling study from Amana Bera in Angle Petrchev's group seems to show. So over here in the kind of purpley mauve color, we've got the threshold current for the layer five pyramidal cells, which happens to be lower than that of the layer four and the layer two, three neurons, and considerably lower than those in layer one and layer six. Um, but one important thing to notice is that, particularly for these three, there's likely to be considerable overlap in the thresholds for simulation. And this is, again, important, as we'll see a little bit later. Now, the site of stimulation of the neurons is likely to be um, axon bends and branching points or terminals. And actually, in this paper by Amman, um, they suggested that it was likely to be the axon terminals. Uh, and stimulation at each of these points, in any case, is likely to occur at the point where the electric field is maximal. And so it follows then that stimulation will occur at sites in the brain where the electric field is the strongest. And modeling of this tends to suggest uh, quite consistently, I think, that this is likely to be up in the gyral crowns and, and the kind of lip. So again, it's likely that we're stimulating relatively superficial structures uh, in the brain with TMS. So 
What do we use TMS for? Um, you know, a whole host of things. We said use it for studying cerebral physiology and brain behavior relationships. And we have a whole load of techniques available to us to do that. So single pulse um, was obviously, obviously developed first. And we use that for studying physiology, response outputs, and also for disrupting processing online to look at brain behavior relationships. We've got repetitive TMS, which was developed a little bit later. And so these trains of pulses produce long lasting effects on the cortex lasting minutes or sometimes hours, um, which is useful for studying uh, plasticity in the brain. And these lasting effects we think might um, have some benefit therapeutically. And hence this, this is the basis for the therapeutic use of, of brain stimulation. We've got twin coil paradigms, which are useful for studying um, connectivity between brain regions, in this case, primary motor areas. And we've got paired pulse paradigms where two pulses are delivered uh, through the same coil to test intracortical connectivity, intracortical excitability. Um, and alongside those kind of TMS hardware kind of developments, we've also got the combination of TMS with other hardware. So for example, neural navigation, which allows us to better target different areas of the brain. We've got the combination of TMS with EEG, both to record the responses to TMS across the scalp. Um, so we're not limited to just looking at output from primary motor cortex to a hand muscle, for example. Um, and also EEG-driven TMS, which allows us to look at state-dependent, brain-state-dependent responses to stimulation. Um, we saw many years ago um, the development of TMS fMRI, so responding to bold activation responses to TMS. And most recently, and quite impressively, um, Alexander Sack was at it again, uh, showing that you could combine TMS with EEG and fMRI. So we have a whole array of techniques available to us and it's for these reasons that um, TMS is a mainstay in cognitive science, in, in clinical neurophysiology, uh, in psychiatry. But as I've kind of already alluded to, in some senses TMS is relatively uh, a blunt tool. It activates a relatively large patch of cortex. Um, it activates a mixture of neural types uh, so we're probably going to activate excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, some projecting uh, towards M1, some projecting out, some, out, out away from M1, and some that are local. And it's also likely to recruit a variable proportion of different neural types across different individuals. And this is likely to vary as a function of cortical morphology and into individual differences in, in neuronal physiology. And this potentially causes issues with both our measurements. It can potentially contribute to inter and inter tri individual variability in our measurement outcomes, as well as um, physiological and behavioral responses to repetitive TMS paradigms. So for example, Eric Wasserman showed um, a number of years ago, he was interested in uh, inter inter-individual variability in response to TMS, and so in, in terms of some of our measurements. And one of the examples that he gave was the variability in response to the SICKI paradigm, short interval intracortical inhibition, which is thought to test a form of GABAergic inhibition in the cortex. And essentially it uses a subthreshold conditioning TMS pulse to condition a subsequent supra-threshold TMS pulse, which evokes an MEP in a uh, peripheral muscle. And the conditioning pulse has the effect of suppressing the MEP when it works. And so if you look at the condition to unconditioned MEP amplitude, this ratio values below one uh, reflect the suppression of the MEP and values above one reflect a facilitation of the MEP. And on the y-axis here is uh, this is essentially a histogram, so we're showing the number of people showing a particular response size. And what's interesting is that there's quite a number of people who don't show SICKI, who seem to show facilitation instead of inhibition. And if you were naive, you might think, well, you know, this seems to suggest they don't have gabaragic inhibition in the brain. 
but that of course is bonkers. Um, they presumably do. Um, and so it's likely to be a problem with our measurement, the tools that we're using. Another example comes from, uh, I guess, a now famous study by Masashi Hamada, who was in John Rothwell's lab at the time. And they were interested in the variability of response outcomes to uh, theta burst stimulation, so uh, two particular repetitive TMS paradigms. And so essentially what they did was to measure motor evoke potentials from a hand muscle before and after delivering the, the theta burst paradigm. And so they measured for up to 30 minutes after the delivery of the paradigm. And on the y-axis here, we're again, we've got the normalized MEP amplitudes where numbers below one reflect uh, suppression and numbers above one reflect facilitation. And each of these lines reflects the responses from a different individual in the study. And what's quite obvious from looking at this is that there's huge variability in response to this paradigm. And one of the things that they said contributed to this variability was the fact that um, a given TMS pulse recruits a variable proportion of neural types in different individuals. Now, in addition to these variability issues, um, one other thing about TMS is that we often can't associate different aspects of neural function, which might be potentially informative. So for example, changes in membrane versus synaptic function. Um, and I'll give you an example of why this might be interesting or useful a little bit later. So are things really all that bad or can conventional TMS be selective with respect to the types of neurons uh, that it activates? Well, the answer is that it's not all that bad. Um, we've known for quite a long time that the orientation of the current induced in the brain influences the output from primary motor cortex. Um, so typically, if you wanted to stimulate the primary motor cortex, the hand area, you would hold the coil in this way so that you induce uh, a current in the brain that is anterior to posterior with respect to the hand knob in the uh, precentral gyrus. But you can evoke motor evoke potentials with different current orientations. Um, so for example, if you reverse the current induced in the brain by 180 degrees, you can still produce an MEP. But what's noticeable is that the threshold for producing an MEP is much greater with anterior to posterior currents. And if you look at the response latency, the onset latency of the motor evoke potential, you notice that it's two to three milliseconds later. And the assumption here is that the different current orientations are recruiting different neurons in the primary motor cortex that output to the spinal cord. Um, another example um, that we've known about for a long time is that stimulus intensity influences the, the balance of excitation and inhibition in the cortex. And so in this study by Nick Davey, uh, what they were doing was stimulating primary motor cortex um, whilst people were performing a weak background muscle contraction. Um, and so what you can see here is some weak voluntary muscle activity. And then you get the TMS pulse occurring at time zero. And this is followed 20 odd milliseconds later by a brief period of excitation. This is the motor potential in the rectified EMG. And what they noticed was that if you turn the stimulation intensity down a little bit and you zoom in on the y-axis, so here's your background voluntary muscle activity, here's the stimulus artifact again, instead of excitation, instead of a motor of a potential, what they saw instead now was a brief period of suppression. And so what this suggests is that the net output or the net um, I guess what you recruit in that terms is influenced by the stimulus intensity. So that at low stimulus intensities, inhibition dominates, and at high intensities, excitation seems to dominate. But they're both presumably there at the same time. Finally, uh, we've known for quite a while that the shape of the pulse, this is the normalized electric field produced by different stimulators actually influences the output again from primary motor cortex. 
So the monophasic pulses, which are asymmetric, they have this large initial phase followed by a smaller uh, second phase, are typically used to assess cord corresponding excitability and cord corresponding excitability. Um, whereas these other pulse shapes, these more symmetric pulse shapes, are typically used for repetitive stimulation um, because they're more efficient. Um, you can fire the machine quicker um, without having to fully recharge the machine because it returns some of the energy. Um, and if we look again at motor evoked potential latencies in response to different pulse shapes of different current directions, um, we notice again, as I just showed you on the left, that um, AP pulses tend to recruit motor evoked potentials with a longer latency compared to monophasic PA pulses. This directional sensitivity sensitivity disappears when you use these more symmetric pulse shapes. So there is some degree of selectivity that we can achieve with conventional TMS. But recently we've seen uh, the development of what have been described as controllable pulse parameter TMS, CTMS. Um, and here's Angle Petrichev who developed uh, one of these devices. This is him with a prototype device that uh, I used in the lab with John Rothwell for a number of years. And one of the nice things about this machine compared to what I just showed you on the previous page where all of those pole shapes were produced by different devices that were intended for slightly different purposes. Well, now these machines can flexibly adapt the pole shape so you can go for a more monophasic or asymmetric pulses in black here to biphasic or more symmetric pulses in blue. You can also modulate the duration of the initial phase of this pulse, so from short duration in blue to longer duration in red. And whereas typically we were only able to do repetitive TMS with those biphasic symmetric pulses, we can now achieve high frequency repetitive stimulation with more asymmetric or monophasic pulses. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about is uh, why some of these things might be interesting and useful to us. Excuse me. Okay, so pulse width modulation um, is easily achievable with traditional electrical stimulators and has been used for a long time to study peripheral nerve function. So one of these uses, for example, uh, is to describe the strength duration behavior of sensory motor axons. And this essentially describes how the threshold current required to excite an axon changes as a function of the stimulus duration or the pulse width. And you can see that here, longer pulse durations require lower currents to elicit a response. And you can also see that there's some difference in the response of sensory motor axons, which if you look at the figure on the right, becomes more clear if you instead plot charge on the y-axis, um, which is the product of current and stimulus duration, again you get stimulus duration. And so you get this nice linear relationship and if you extrapolate back to zero on the y-axis you get uh, a number which describes this relationship uh, for each of these two types of axons and this is known as the strength duration time constant and you can see that it's much longer in sensory axons compared to motor axons. Now this relationship is um, largely influenced by sodium conductance. Um, it is influenced by other things like membrane potential. Um, but for this reason, it can potentially provide us with specific information about ion channel function. Now, in addition to different neural types showing different strength duration behavior, um, neurodegenerative disorders such as ALS or motor neuron disease show characteristic changes very early on uh, in the early stages of disease and the strength duration behavior. And certain drugs like sodium channel blockers um, can also affect the strength duration behavior of peripheral axons. 
finally, uh, it should be clear from particularly this figure on the right hand side, if you look at long stimulus durations, there's a very clear separation in the charge required to elicit uh, an action potential in sensory versus motor axon, particularly at long duration compared to short duration um, stimuli. And what this means is that in a mixed nerve, you can selectively recruit uh, sensory axons using a large or long uh, pulse duration without activating motor axons. And this selectivity is potentially useful, as we'll come to in a moment. Now, for a long time, you, we weren't able to evaluate the strength duration behavior of cortical axons. We can do this because standard TMS devices couldn't modulate pulse duration. Uh, but recently, Angle Petrchev, um, who developed the CTMS, showed that this was possible with CTMS. So they used different pulse durations to stimulate the primary motor cortex and record motor evoked potentials in the hand muscle again. And what they showed was that the threshold current required to produce an MEP declined in that characteristic way as uh, the pulse duration increased. And using this information, they were able to estimate a neural membrane time constant. And quite nicely, this estimate of the time constant um, approximated a similar estimate produced by electrical stimulation, invasive electrical stimulation, um, performed several years earlier by David Burke when he was stimulating um, cortical spinal neurons. Um, in a later study, uh, that I was involved in that was led by Kevin Dostilio and again we had the help of Angle Petrchev um, and his group. We this time evaluated the structuration behavior in response to different pulse orientations, so AP and PA currents. And essentially what you can see in this figure here is that strength duration behavior is influenced by the current orientation. And this in turn leads to differences in the strength duration time constants for AP and PA currents, which kind of led us to think that, again, this was more evidence that AP and PA currents are recruiting uh, different neural populations with different physiological properties. Now, while this is potentially quite exciting, this is quite a nice development, really, because we've not been able to do this. And the reason it's potentially useful is that we can now maybe use this in the diagnosis and tracking of disease states. So for example, um, ALS or motor neuron disease. It might be useful for evaluating uh, the effects of drugs on the brain. Um, Lorenzo Rocchi and I have currently got some data that we're plowing our way through where we were looking at the effects of sodium channel blockers on strength duration behavior in the primary motor cortex. Um, there's a possibility of using these different pulse parameters for selective neural stimulation. And information like this can also feed into biophysical models of how the brain um, responds to TMS pulses. And so this sort of information was actually useful in Amana Berra's model that I showed you a little bit earlier, uh, the study that I was talking about. So on the topic of um, selective neural stimulation, we were interested in, um, you know, whether this could be achieved in the cortex and what the implications would be for measurement outcomes. So what we did in a study, and actually Kevin Dostilio uh, did this, but we kind of uh, expanded and built on this in a later study, was to look at the effects of different current orientations and pulse durations on responses uh, in a hand muscle, so again stimulating primary motor cortex. And what I'm showing here is the onset latency of single motor unit potentials recorded in the hand. And what's quite obvious is that regardless of the pulse duration, AP currents seem to re recruit response with a longer latency than PA currents. It's also quite obvious that the PA currents seem to be unaffected by the pulse duration. The onset latency is the same, regardless of the pulse duration. But for AP currents, it's clear that the short duration 30 microsecond pulse produces a response with a longer onset latency by about a, a millisecond or so, maybe a little bit longer, compared to the long duration AP pulse. 
And so what it seems to suggest is that for AP currents, you can recruit two slightly separate or distinguishable populations of neurons just by manipulating uh, the pulse duration. So yeah, it does seem that the combination of both uh, current direction and, and pulse duration can help you to achieve slightly more selective neural stimulation. Uh, the question then is, so what, who cares? Um, to see whether this really mattered or influenced some of our measurement outcomes, we look to a protocol known as short latency afferent inhibition. Um, and short latency afferent inhibition essentially involves stimulating a peripheral nerve um, distally around 20 to 25 milliseconds if you're doing the hand prior to delivering uh, a stimulus over the primary motor cortex. And so this is essentially enough time for the afferent volleys to reach the cortex and have some effect on the sensory motor cortex. And the net effect of this is to suppress the MEPs in response to the, the, the TMS pulse. And so what we did was do this paradigm with each of these different pulse combinations that you see on the left. So on the y-axis here, we've got the normalized MEP amplitude. Um, so values below one show that the MEP was suppressed in response to median nerve stimulation. On the x-axis, we've got two different time intervals that we used, uh, essentially 22 and 24 milliseconds, more or less. And what you can see is that all of these different pulse um, combinations do produce inhibition or do uh, or are suppressed. The MEPs in response to them are suppressed um, in response to the median nerve stimulus, but the effect is much, much stronger um, for the AP30, the short duration AP directed current. Um, and so one implication of this, I guess, is that, you know, the, not all MEPs are, are, are created equally, essentially. And the outcome that you get is going to be influenced by the relative recruitment of different neural, neural different neurons that you recruit. And though we didn't really test this um, in this particular paradigm, it's possible that um, by selecting pulse parameters that more selectively target the neural populations that you're interested in, that is the neural populations that are affected uh, most by the phenomenon you're interested in, we might reduce some of the internal individual variability that we see that comes from the recruitment of different neural type uh, recruitment across different individuals. So this is just one demonstration that our outcomes, our outcome measurements are influenced by the pulse parameters of TMS. And so this is a thing that we need to consider and think about. In a second kind of related study um, that I was involved in, uh, led by Elias Kasula, again, when we were in John Lockwell's lab, um, we were interested in not just what happened in, in primary motor cortex and, and or in particular cortical spinal output pathways, but what happens more broadly uh, to the central motor cortex and the connected cerebral areas. So to do this, um, we used TMS EEG. So we recorded the scalp responses using EEG in response to a range of different CTMS pulse parameters. So we had biphasic pulses, and monophasic pulses of different current orientations, AP directed and PA directed, as well as uh, long duration and short duration pulses. So this figure here shows you the, um, the spatial temporal characteristics of the TMS evoked potentials along with the you know, spatial distribution on the top of these evoked potentials. And this is for the monophasic AP and PA currents. So different currents oriented in different directions across the central sulcus. An interesting thing to note here is that the evoked potential polarity indicated by the colors here is reversed. And essentially this is consistent with the idea that um, TMS is capable of activating structures both in the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus but the relative recruitment of pre and post central gyrus is going to be biased by the particular current orientation. 
So having the same hotspot, but rotating the orientation of the current is going to bias where you stimulate with TMS. And actually, uh, again, Amana Vera's paper suggested a similar sort of thing, but they were suggested that AP currents also start to stimulate slightly more premotor areas um, compared to PA currents, which uh, predominantly will activate uh, primary motor areas. In the same study, we also measured the kind of global scalp response, the global mean field power um, to stimulation. And essentially what this figure is showing here is that monophasic pulses um, produce a greater response compared to biphasic pulses from about 50 milliseconds onwards. And if you look just at the local response, so um, uh, sensory motor kind of cortex, then what you see is that the local mean field power is greater for long duration pulses in the very early window compared to short duration pulses. So without kind of going into the details of, of what all is all going on here, what's clear is that different pulses have different effects. Oh, was yours for this mistake? Different pulses have different effects on the brain despite the same relative intensity being used here. So the absolute stimulus intensities were slightly different here because different pulses have uh, different thresholds for stimulation. But the stimulation was set to 90% of the resting motor threshold. So it was the same in relative terms for all of these different pulses. And the implication of this is that normalizing stimulus intensity doesn't ensure that you recruit a constant set of neurons when you change pulse parameters. So different pulse parameters are going to stimulate slightly different populations of neurons and potentially slightly different targets or different areas of the brain. And controlling for stimulus intensity doesn't control for that. And this has implications again when we're thinking about our measurement outcomes with TMS, but also potentially the responses to repetitive TMS protocols. Okay, so I, I told you earlier that um, Nick Davey had shown us quite a long time ago that the balance of excitation and inhibition recruited in the cortex, in primary cortex, is influenced by the stimulus intensity. And so essentially what, we, what we're saying is that um, TMS is recruiting a mixture of neurons in the cortex and the balance of, of what's recruited with different neural types is going to be affected by pulse parameters. And this is going to have an influence on, again, our measurement outcomes. Um, but it's also going to have an influence potentially on the outcomes uh, in response to repetitive TMS. So understanding how pulse parameters influence the balance of excitation and inhibition is important. And so we're interested in whether pulse duration influenced this balance. And to investigate this, we again turn to the Sicky paradigm. And we were interested in whether conditioning pulses of different duration would have or produce differential effects on MEP suppression. And so the way we tested this was to deliver conditioning pulses of different duration. The intensity of the conditioning pulse in each case was matched in relative terms. So it was set to an equivalent proportion of the active motor threshold, 90% of active motor threshold. Although in absolute terms, the intensities were different because of the strength duration behavior. And what we found was that um, Siki was affected by pulse duration. So on the y-axis here, we've got the normalized MEP amplitude. Um, on the x-axis, we've got the unconditioned test pulse. And here we've got different interstimulus intervals between the conditioning and the test pulse, which are essentially a, approximately about one to five milliseconds apart. And what you can see here is that, um, and, and in, in some of the other figures in the paper, is that both the extent of Siki and the duration of the Siki uh, effect was influenced by pulse duration. So short duration pulses produce less Siki than long duration conditioning pulses. Now this probably means that the neurons responsible for producing Siki are not the same as the neurons responsible for producing the motor effect potential, which is what we use to estimate the resting motor threshold. 
So what this means is that when you set the intensity relative to the uh, resting mode threshold and you change the pulse duration, you're going to recruit um, a slightly different proportion of neurons that are responsible for SICKI in each case. Um, so again, the implication of this is that our measurement outcomes are affected by pulse duration. And if you want to increase the signal to noise ratio, you might want to get uh, the right combination of pulse parameters um, when assessing things like SICKI. Um, it also means that the as I said, the strength duration behavior of SICKI neurons is presumably different to the neurons responsible for the MEP. Um, and so we might be able to indirectly characterize the strength duration behavior of a separate population of neurons, the neurons responsible for SICKI, as well as the neurons responsible for the MEP. And finally, because these things are different, and because the strength duration behavior is different, um, the implication is that the balance of excitation and inhibition recruited by a single TMS pulse is likely to differ depending on the pulse duration. And as I keep saying, this might have implications for uh, the outcomes of repetitive TMS. So I keep saying this, so I guess it's about time to show you what the influence of this might be. Um, We've known for some time, there was hints early on, um, that different pulse parameters might affect uh, the outcomes of RTMS. And so our Ryan colleagues um, looked at the effects of monophasic stimulation and biphasic stimulation in response to a 10 hertz repetitive TMS protocol. So they stimulated primary motor cortex and gain measured motor of potentials um, in a hand muscle. And what they showed was that monophasic pulses oriented anterior to posterior with respect to the central sulcus tended to produce a facilitatory effect whereas the biphasic pulse had no overall effect on, on cortical spinal excitability and the way they explained this was as follows they said this is probably because monophasic pulses preferentially uh, activate a relatively uniform population of neurons oriented in the same direction, and their effects are made more readily uh, than biphasic repetitive TMS activating differently oriented neurons at slightly different timings altogether. Um, now, the fact that different current orientations, as I showed you earlier, and as uh, Amana Bera's paper suggested, potentially also stimulate slightly different areas of the cortex, maybe more anterior or more posterior, it's easy to see how different um, pulse parameters might influence these outcomes, how all these effects sum uh, to produce the net changes in corticospinal excitability. Now, a few people have had a, another go at doing this with the CTMS and, and examining a more diverse range of pulse parameters. Um, so, Stefan Goetz had a go in, in Angel Petrachev's group, um, but this particular example from um, Islam Halawa and Walter Powell's group was, was quite nice, I thought. Essentially, they looked at a one hertz repetitive TMS protocol, stimulating motor cortex again. And they were interested in the symmetry of the pulses. So these blue ones are more asymmetric and the green one here is more symmetric, as well as the pulse duration. So we've got narrow duration pulses in red here and long duration pulses in green over here. And essentially what they showed was that the more asymmetric pulses in blue, as well as the long, uh, shorter duration pulses in blue over here, tended to produce a net inhibitory effect on corticospinal excitability that lasted for up to 30 minutes. But in contrast, the more symmetric pulse shape, as well as the longer duration pulse shape, seem to have a facilitatory effect. Um, so it's quite a clear demonstration that pulse parameters really do uh, influence the outcomes that you get from repetitive TMS. The question then, of course, is whether this has any consequence for behavior. I mean, ultimately, if we're interested in um, therapeutic outcomes or if we're interested in you know, virtual lesions, in cognitive neuroscience, 
um, then we really want to know that these pulse parameters are important for kind of producing more reliable after effects on behavior. At the moment, there's not a huge amount of evidence for this, um, except that uh, a recent study from, again, from Water Palaces Group, um, looked at the effects of a deep burst paradigm so a high, fre high frequency pattern form of stimulation um, with monophasic pulses. So traditionally this was done with biphasic pulses. And they were interested in the effects of current direction on a simple finger tapping task. And essentially what they showed was that um, PA directed pulses with this intermittent theta burst stimulation paradigm produced a small decline in the normalized finger tapping rate, so they impaired motor performance briefly, um, whereas the AP-directed currents didn't have such an effect. Um, so this is kind of, you know, it's a very small effect, um, but it's a kind of hint that some of these pulse parameters, again, might be important, not just in terms of the physiological outcomes, but also in terms of influencing behavior, uh, which I think is often what we're really trying to get at. Okay, so I'm getting close to the end now. Um, so one final thing that again, I think relates to, particularly to repetitive TMS, but I guess it could also be important um, in evaluations of cortical excitability, is the sensation, you know, the perceptual experience of TMS. Um, Angle Petrachev and Holly Lismby, um investigated this recently and essentially they were interested in the influence of pulse duration on how TMS is perceived. Uh, so in this left figure they asked people to rate how uncomfortable a TMS stimulus was in response to pulses of different duration but also of different stimulus intensity, so high and low stimulus intensities. And what they showed was that um, Longer duration pulses were rated as slightly less uncomfortable, so slightly more comfortable than short duration pulses. Um, and longer duration pulses were also rated as less sharp uh, than short duration pulses. Now this sort of thing, if you're stimulating kind of primary motor areas or areas where there's not a lot of facial muscles, is probably not so important, I guess, but these kind of things do become important if you're thinking about um, stimulation of frontal areas, particularly in, for example, the treatment of drug resistant depression, where it's really uncomfortable. Um, you know, you get a lot of facial muscle twitching, a lot of blinking, and it's not very pleasant. And uh, this potentially affects the tolerability um, of repetitive TMS over those sorts of areas. Um, and it's also a potential thing to consider when thinking about the blinding of um, experimental designs. So, you know, when you're using sham conditions, how you actually achieve that. And um, because we know that, you know, people's perceptions of, of the sort of treatment they're receiving could potentially influence their outcomes. Now, in this study, they didn't really address those issues. This was kind of a basic um, science question. Uh, and so it remains op an open question, you know, what influence this has on tolerability and blinding, but it's a potentially important consideration and it's something that we can now address with CTMS. Okay, um, so I'll quickly wrap up and summarize some of the things, some of the findings, what we've seen so far um, from studies using CTMS. It's clear that pulse parameters influence our measurements of cortical, cortical excitability. I showed you that they affect short latency afferent inhibition. Um, it affects our measurement of SICI. And so we might want to consider not only the, the conditioning pulse, but also the test pulse in these paradigms to, I guess, optimize the paradigms to increase the signal to noise ratio and decrease variability in these paradigms. There's emerging evidence that the pulse parameters are also important in terms of the physiological and potentially behavioral outcomes of repetitive TMS protocols. 
And pulse parameters also seem to affect the perceptual experience of TMS, which might be important, uh, particularly for repetitive TMS and, and the therapeutic use of TMS, especially when stimulating over areas with lots of kind of facial muscles. And pulse parameters seem to do this by influencing, uh, at least in part, what is stimulated, the uh, proportion of different neural types that are affected by TMS, as well as potentially where TMS is effective in the brain. So which part of the cortex TMS is most effective, which isn't the same uh, necessarily, even when the kind of supposed hotspot is identical. Um, we've also seen that the structuration properties of cortical axons um, those responsible for motor potentials and potentially those responsible for sicky effects, um, are potentially, we're potentially able to characterize them uh, using CTMS now. And so the overall outlook, I guess, um, just to kind of summarize more broadly, is that Relatively poor spatial and neuronal targeting with non-invasive brain stimulation techniques like TMS may contribute to some of the suboptimal measurement outcomes and repetitive TMS effects. Oh, another typo. And this hinders the routine use of these methods, sometimes in the diagnosis and treatment of neurological conditions, but they're also important um, in cognitive and motor neuroscience as well. So novel, novel devices and methodologies um, that are permitted by CTMS might offer improved targeting and provide more detailed information on cortical physiology. So for example, where the strength duration time constant might provide specific information on the functioning of ion channels. And in theory, this could lend to better measurements for probing specific aspects of cortical physiology and improve the reliability of outcomes in a therapeutic setting. Um, but I guess the important thing, you know, to, to kind of note here is that a lot of this stuff that I've been showing you is the kind of the basic uh, physiological background. Um, and there's still a lot of work, I guess, that needs to be done to show that these things really are of consequence, particularly for repetitive TMS. Um, but I guess there's at least reason for optimism. And the important thing now is that we have the tools to be able to investigate these questions properly. Um, and so on that note, I think I'll finish and very quickly acknowledge a few people, in particular John Rothwell, whose lab I was in um, when I did much of this work. Obviously, not, not all of it's mine, but um, and also thank you to Rogue Research um, who and Brainbox as well for the loan of the CTMS equipment uh, and technical, technical support with the CTMS. So thank you all for listening. Um, I'll stop sharing and oh, thank you, Ricky. Maybe, um, maybe there's some questions. Yep. Thank you so, so much for that talk. Um, it was really good. I feel like the CTMS or the Elevate TMS, as you now called, is a real game changer as it kind of changes all the phenomena that we've been observing for the past thirty years. So it's fantastic to hear that from you. We do have a couple of questions. If you're happy to answer them. You've kindly allocated. 15 minutes to do so. Uh, so the first one is, can you briefly explain whether the pulse duration and width affect the basic properties of neurons, like the all or none phenomena, phenomenon of the action potential fatigue and phenomenon of extinction? Um, potentially this is relation uh, in relation to I guess the after effects of repetitive stimulation. Um, in truth, I guess I don't know. Um, you know, the effects of repetitive stimulation, um, we often talk about them in terms of their effects on synaptic efficacy. Um, but of course, they could have effects on the membrane itself. Um, Actually, distinguishing those things is is difficult, but I guess you could potentially start to look at effects on the membrane properties by examining the strength duration behavior of those axons after repetitive TMS protocols, and maybe that would give you a hint as to membrane changes versus synaptic changes. 
although there's obviously going to be ongoing synaptic changes. So whether that pans out, I don't know. Um, but in terms of these phenomena, I guess the answer is, I don't know. Um, you know, something like fatigue, we'd, we'd have to see. Um, people have shown that repetitive TMS uh, can influence kind of sensory motor fatigue in, in some cases. And so it's possible that different pulse parameters might modulate uh, that effect. But, but yeah, at the moment, it's, it's not obvious. Great stuff. Thank you for taking time to answer that. We've got one more question now. Uh, do you think the future for personalized treatments, we will see a closed loop system with EG and CTMS? Um, good question. Um, there's obviously huge interest in closed loop um, brain stimulation at the moment. Uh, so, for example, with TMS, EG driven TMS and um, uh, the, the chaps in Germany are, are kind of pioneering this approach. Christoph Zrenner in, in particular is interested in this sort of thing. Um, and they've seen kind of, they've, they've seen to see some promise or some success with this kind of technique. Um, in contrast, Hartwig Siebner's group have not been able to kind of replicate their kind of results. So it seems that EG driven TMS is, um, more tricky than we thought and uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on that front um, and maybe yeah I mean it's possible that you know combination with more optimized pulse parameters that you might see kind of uh, more reliable after effects with closed loop stimulation so yeah that is a possibility I don't know that anyone has done that sort of thing yet um, I guess you know, like I said earlier, we're kind of still in the very early stages of working out what pulse parameters do what. And there's probably still a bit of work to be done on that front. And it might be the case that at some point, you know, we settle on a particular set of pulse parameters um, and we use the kind of fixed set of pulse parameters in combination with EEG or, or, or not. Um, so, yeah, I think, it, I think it's a possibility, but I think it's probably we need to work out what pulse parameters um, we need and then we'll probably set a, set a one one and maybe manufacturers at some point will will change their standard or default pulse parameters if we find an optimal one or maybe we won't um, yeah that sorry for that wishy washy kind of uh, <laughs> maybe we will maybe we won't but it, it's definitely an interesting prospect so thanks so I've actually got a question for you myself which is a bit of a like weird viva question but if you were given an infinite sum of money and the CTMS, what would you do with it? Oof, what would I do with it? Um, more flexibility. Um, uh, I know that you can, I mean, it's difficult at the moment, for example, to do different pulse parameters, uh, certain things. It's difficult to do sicky with this sort of thing. Um, it's difficult to combine certain pulse shapes. So, so some of these experiments, like the sicky ones we were doing, we went kind of old school and we were holding two coils, one over another, um, rather than being able to do everything through the same coil. Um, but for me as a basic neuroscientist, uh, the thing that's especially appealing to me about the CTMS is the flexibility of it and the ability to kind of um, study things that we've not been able to study uh, so far um, and I guess the, uh, <laughs> I've just seen that someone say oh, good question Rory um, yeah I don't know I guess uh, more flexibility for me um, I don't have a specific question in mind um, but uh, yeah okay on that note then I'd like to thank you again for your time it was a really good talk on a really interesting set of applications and it's certainly planted some ideas in my mind and i'm sure it has in the delegates minds too so thank you again ricky for giving up your morning very early in the morning as well for you for doing this no worries, no worries. good to see you rory yeah, thanks good. everyone for, for joining again